Afternoon, everyone. We've been building microservices at the Financial Times now for over five years. And I'm going to talk about why we adopted that architecture, what we think we've got from it, how we've had to change the way we work to be successful, and what we found essential in order to operate them. But I'd like to start by getting a view for how many of you are operating microservices in production. Could you put your hand up if you're doing that? Can you keep your hand up if you've been doing it for two years? Can you keep your hand up if you've been doing it for four years? So some of you are in there early, you're probably feeling some of the same pain that we are. I'm going to start off by talking about some of the kinds of things that can go wrong. So towards the end of last year, we got reports that people hitting FT.com were getting a 404 page. Quite quickly, we realized the problem had to do with a redirect that had been set up. And we have a lot of redirects on FT.com, and that's because this is what our URLs look like. So for a stream of articles about a particular topic, we have a stream page with a unique identifier indicating that topic. This is not a thing that you can share with a friend easily. So we have friendlier URLs that people can actually refer to. But that means that we have something like 70,000 redirects set up on FT.com. And that's all managed via a small microservice that we wrote a couple of years ago, maybe three or four years ago. So we realized very quickly that we'd set up a redirect from one of our main pages to a page that didn't exist. We went into the tool, tried to remove that redirect, couldn't. We were just getting errors saying, cannot be done. Some kind of circular dependency thing going on. So we started to feel a little bit of pressure at this point because this is not good. You know, journalists don't like it when their news is not being seen and actually the 404 pages. So we started thinking about, well, maybe we just restore the database from a backup. And I had some very good developers working with me on this. We realized that we actually didn't know how to find the database. We weren't sure whether there was actually a backup. That's because none of us had ever had a look at this service before. Some microservices don't get changed very often. This one had been written three years previously and no one had made any changes to it ever since. It works fine. Uh, when something does go wrong, you're really dependent on, did someone put some good documentation together? Is there good monitoring? Um, can we work out what we need to do? And it's worse for microservices than for a monolith because microservices, you can choose the right tool for the job. So the database that we're using for this service may not be the same database we're using somewhere else. You could be in a different language. And that's great until you need to work out how this database is backed up. So microservices tend to have more different types of things involved and you need to have some understanding of all of that. Second example, we had reports from our editors that the list on our homepage wasn't being updated. This is critical. It's how the editors say this is the story we want people to read. And our first assumption was, well, something must be going wrong in publishing these lists. Well, that involves three different technology groups and something like 12 different microservices. So our first problem is, well, where would that have gone wrong? We do have tracing, so we can trace that publish all the way through the stack. And we were able to see that actually publishing was fine. The problem was in our read API. And this is our Pingdom URL monitoring telling us that we were getting errors back from the database and it was taking a long time. And if you look carefully, you'll see this started out just at home time, carried on till about 11.30 at night. This is the point where we got it stable. We realized there was a heavy CPU load on our graph database. We tried a few things, uh, seemed to get better. We didn't actually understand why. Turned out, 24 hours later, we realized what had happened. And this is, the scale of this is interesting, because it's only about 10 on the, on the left-hand side. Basically, the green and purple peaks on the right-hand side just indicate um, things that were starting to error. It's about 10 queries in the space of 10 minutes. So it's a tiny number of queries got massively inefficient. Now, in a monolith, in a relational database, we might have been able to point at a schema change. But here, all that had happened in the graph was that someone had inserted some more nodes and some more relationships, and it made an existing query really inefficient. So basically, it's complicated to work out what's going on. They're more complicated to operate and maintain. Um, what I'm aiming to show with these examples is just these are complex distributed systems. Uh, rather than a couple of services, you might have hundreds. And if it, those of you that are operating microservices already know this. So the question is, why bother? And the answer is the same as it should be for any technological, technical decision, which is you bother because of business reasons. We do microservices because it helps us as a business. And so I need to tell you a little bit about the business of the Financial Times. This is a video I took on a print tour 
We still print our paper in Bow in East London, and if you work for the FT, you can go and have a look at the paper being printed. But we don't describe ourselves as a newspaper anymore. We say we are one of the world's leading business and financial news organisations. And the reason for that is most people read the FT online, on a phone, tablet, uh, or um, computer. We have a paywall. We make more money from subscriptions than we do from advertising. And if you know anything about print advertising or digital advertising, you'll know that's actually a really positive thing because both of them are tanking. You don't make money from advertising the way that you used to. News industry is in an interesting place because of that. Local newspapers are really struggling. And for national and international newspapers, you've got to find a way to get money. If you don't have a paywall, that's extremely difficult. But one thing that's going to be critical for us in the next couple of years is the ability to experiment with new things to try out new sources of revenue, build new products. Saw a talk from Linda Rising last year where she said that actually most organizations say the experiment, but they don't. Because it is not an experiment if you don't have a hypothesis and if you can't fail. And the reason that most organizations don't do that is because as soon as you spent quite a lot of money on something, you're really reluctant to say, no, that didn't work. It's the sunk cost fallacy. We spent three months of a team building this stuff. You're not going to measure and say, oh, yeah, that wasn't very good. We'll just give that up. So you really only get a culture of experimentation if you can experiment quickly and cheaply. And when you can do that, you have a chance of people saying, we're going to try this thing, and here's what will indicate that it's successful. So we have A-B testing built into FT.com. It's been there from the beginning. And we run hundreds of A-B tests a year. And we really genuinely do turn things off if they don't work. So an example from quite early on is we have a page that lists all of our film reviews. And we decided we would add the rating that we gave to the films onto this page. What we found is that meant no one actually went and read any of the film reviews. They just scanned for the score. So we removed it. To run the volume of A-B tests we do, though, it's not just about having the framework. You also need to be able to release the code. You need to have the code path that lets you have the blurb or not the blurb. So that means we need to do thousands of changes a year. We need to optimize for being able to change frequently. But releasing changes frequently doesn't just happen. It's hard work. Uh, we had to put in a lot of effort, and it was a massive cultural change for us at the FT. I'd say start to end, it took three to four years to do this. It, we think it's been worth it, but it is an effort. Done right, microservices enable the ability to release changes frequently. Uh, we've done it for a combination of continuous delivery, DevOps, and microservices. The three together have let us get to the point where we can release code all the time. But as I said at the beginning, yeah, we've been doing it for five years. So we need to think about what happens when teams get smaller, they move on to new things, and now you've got three developers uh, maintaining a system that's got 150 microservices, and most of them, they've never looked at the code. So what happens? How do you stop systems from being unloved, unmaintained, and risky? And I think you need to be prepared for this, because the next legacy system, for most of us, is going to be made up on microservices. And that actually is going to make it a lot more hard. So we're going to talk about three things today. So first of all, optimizing for speed. Why I think that's important, and what has to change to let you do that. Then, how to build microservices uh, so that they are, you can operate them. And then finally, what happens when people move on. So the first thing I want to talk about is optimizing for speed. It's had a big impact on the ways that we work, the way we architect things, all our processes. And we think that releasing changes frequently is the way to approach software development. But until fairly recently, we didn't have any evidence for this. And I am sure that you have seen this book many times so far. It seems to be the book of the, a book of the conference. But it is brilliant. Because, first of all, it's short, doesn't take very long to read, but also it's full of actual data. So it talks about what it, what it takes to build high-performing software de delivery organizations. And when they say high-performing, they mean ones that have a positive impact in their business. So they affect the profitability, the market share, the productivity of the business that they're part of. And Nicole, Jez, and Jean have identified four measures. That are, that are basically correlated with those high-performing organizations. And they're targeted at outcomes. So they're not outputs, they're outcomes. And they are delivery lead time. So uh, how long does it take you to get something out into production? How off, deployment frequency, how often you deploy? Uh, how long it would take you to fix something when it goes wrong? And how many of the changes that you release uh, are failure? So these are the high-performer scores. But 
just want to talk about the top two at the moment, which note that these, these relate to speed. High performing organizations release changes frequently. It has a positive impact on their business. And continuous delivery is the foundation of that. So who's doing continuous delivery here? Lots of people, which is good. Um, the thing that I took from reading the continuous delivery book was if it hurts, do it more frequently, bring the pain forward. The aim with continuous delivery is to get to the point where releasing software is something that you do all the time so it isn't scary. I've been in software development for a long time. I can remember releases that were absolutely terrifying. The developers that have joined my organization in the last couple of years just don't have that feeling. They don't have that fear of releasing. They fully expect that they will commit some code, it will get released, it will be fine. If they have to roll it back, that will work too. And that wasn't the case 10 years ago. So our old build and deployment process was very manual, and I'm only really talking back to about 2013, so it's not that old. I'm going to show you a small part of the instructions for doing it. So these are six steps. There were 54 steps in this release plan. Someone went and sat in front of a computer and typed out 54 steps to do the release. Um, it's horrifying. Uh, it was never correct. People always made mistakes. Um, and then the people running it would go, oh, they meant this server instead. Um, so it's not repeatable. It's totally error prone. And we did, had to do it uh, at the weekend because we had to freeze publication to the website to be able to release code. And you know the news generally happens all the time. Luckily, we do business and financial news. You could probably take a couple of hours on a Saturday that it's fine to not publish news. But that meant that the out of hours releases, you have to have people around to check that they worked. Um, and you'd better hope that if it goes wrong, the people who are around can understand which part of all the code that's in the release actually has caused the problems. But the big, <coughs> the big problem with this <coughs> is that you can't experiment when you're only doing 12 releases a year because you're, you're putting together a month's worth of work. So let's say that you release some code and you notice that people are reading fewer articles. You have no idea what caused that because you've got so many different bits of features that are in there. You, you can't experiment. So we basically needed to improve our ability to experiment. We wanted to go much more quickly and we adopted continuous delivery. So what does it involve? Well, three key elements, and I think everyone does the first two, and I think sometimes people don't do the third. So the first thing is an automated build and release pipeline. So this is manager's code, version controlled, and it should be possible to recreate your pipeline from scratch whenever you need to. And it's all about making it so easy to do a release. And it's not about basically not considering carefully about doing the release. You know, we think carefully about the risk. So for example, because today is the UK election, people will be much more cautious about the changes they put out because no one wants to explain to the journalists that they can't report the news because of something we put out. Second thing is automated testing. If you want to be able to move fast, you can't stop and do full manual regression testing. And I, I go back to the, to the days of a big Excel spreadsheet for all the manual regression testing so that you could take days to do that. Uh, that's not possible anymore. You, you can do some manual exploratory testing, but you're, the most of your testing needs to be automated part of your pipeline. But the third thing is continuous integration. If you aren't using your pipeline all the time, then you aren't benefited from it. You want to be releasing code through master many times a day. Um, this is just basically avoids merging. It means you have small changes that you can get, get out and basically lets you move fast. And if you aren't releasing multiple times a day, I think you need to think about what's stopping you. There are some situations where you can't. It's harder if you're getting into an app store. But if you're building a website, this should be just the basic thing that you're always doing. Otherwise, you're adopting microservices, you're incurring a lot of increased complexity, and you aren't actually benefiting from it. So I said we made quite a lot of changes to support being able to move fast building microservices. And the first thing was about architecture. So we wanted to be able to uh, release at any time. And that meant we had to change our architecture so that you didn't have to stop publishing when something was released. So zero time downtime deployments. It's the first thing that we had to do. And I would say we did a review recently about the things we do for quality. And I, I rate this massively high because as soon as you can release at any point, all the people who can help you if there's a problem are right there. Everyone's in, your, in the office at the right time. We mostly do sequ sequential deployments and we mostly have schemaless databases. But if we do have relational databases, we make sure that we can 
fail over to one region, upgrade the database in the other region, replay any uh, writes, and effectively always have the system working. And there's a nice side effect to this, which is, you know, if it goes wrong, everyone's there. You need to be able to test and deploy your changes independently. You can't be waiting for another team. You can't be waiting for a shared integration environment because that slows you down. Any time that there is coordination is, not, is something that's going to make it harder for you to move fast. And that means you need teams and systems to be loosely coupled. So what the authors of Accelerate found is, is that being able to move fast, being a high-performing organization isn't actually related to having a microservices architecture. It's related to having um, a loosely coupled architecture. It's just that microservices makes it easier for you to be loosely coupled. Or rather, in a monolith, it's quite easy to accidentally couple things together without even noticing. But the microservices have you know, very obvious boundaries. You're passing a message. You're making a call. Uh, it's generally something where you can see exactly what's going on and you know whether the payload is going to be affected. So you can work out where the, what the blast radius is for any change that you're doing. So architectural changes was one thing. We actually needed to change quite a lot of our process as well. And all of our process changes are dedicated to reducing the need for coordination. So when I joined the FT, we had a change approval board. Who's had a cab in their organization? Who's still got one? You need to get rid of it <laughs> because it, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, basically, so when you have a cab, you don't improve your ability to catch problems, you just slow everything down. So it's process theater. So basically it's, let's all get in a room and talk about it, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually, um, make a difference. So the change approval boards, uh, when we had one release a month, yeah, sometimes we might have a discussion about how these two things might conflict. But really, the best people to make a decision about whether there's a risk releasing something are the people who are writing the code. They, they know what they've written. You don't want to have to go and explain it to something, someone else. And there's some research in Accelerate that change approval boards don't reduce the chance of failure. But they don't actually increase the chance of failure, so that's good but they absolutely screw you on all the other measures. So you will release less frequently, you will release bigger chunks of functionality, and if you need to fix something, it will take you longer because you've got to go and coordinate with someone else. So we don't have a cab anymore, and I don't think it's had an impact on our quality, but it's let us move a lot quicker. The second thing we used to do was for every change request, we would fill out a form in Salesforce so you'd fill this form out, and you know you have normal changes and emergency changes. Normal changes, someone else has to say, yes, I've reviewed these changes, but of course you haven't. You're just trusting your developer friend who says it's all fine. So it's, again, it's process theater. Um, the way we review changes is quite established. It's a code review. It's a PR. We don't need to go and check something in somewhere else. But what I realized with this as well is the, when we built our first microservice system that I was in charge of, we did around more than 2,000 releases in a year. And I calculated how long it took us to fill out the form, and I worked out that it would take us 47 working days to fill out change request forms. That is not a good use of anyone's time. 10 minutes of form. To be honest, it mostly took more than 10 minutes. But basically, we now have a change API. You call it as part of the build pipeline. We still know when you've made a change. So we still have the thing that was actually valuable, which is, there is a change, but we don't have the, the coordination and the slowing everything down. So, you know, I'm saying, yeah, we release fast now. So how often do we actually release code at the FT? Well, we know because I can graph the calls to the change API, and I did this a couple of days ago. So this is 30, the last 30 days of releases. It's 4,000 changes, pretty much, which is about 180 per working day. Um, and there are two things about this that I really like. Uh, we don't seem, I don't know if you've seen the debate on Twitter about don't deploy on Fridays. Um, yeah? <laughs> uh, we, don't, we don't avoid deploying on Fridays. I mean, we might avoid deploying in the last 10 minutes on Friday, but you know, we wouldn't want to wait. That's a lot of changes that are sat there waiting to go out on the next day. The other thing I really like is no deploys at the weekend at all. So that suggests that we've got our work-life balance right. And I've worked at places where you, if you'd run this, you would have seen it. So that is really satisfying. I did a bit more of a, a detailed dig a while ago to look at our content platform releases. So the first year that, well, no, in 2017, for the content delivery and publishing platform, so just part of the FT, we did about 
2,500 releases, so it's just around 10 per working day. And I thought I'd go back and do a graph for the monolith that this replaced. And it is the same scale, and there genuinely is data on the graph. In fact, on this, th this is such a big screen, you might actually be able to see that. <laughs> yeah, normally you can't see it at all. Um, so we're releasing 250 times as often, uh, which is absolutely great. But what about failure? What about the change failure rate? So going back to the accelerate metrics, the change failure rate for high performing teams is zero to 15%. For comparison, medium and low performers have a change fail rate of up to 45%. Now, I, have, I actually find this astonishing that nearly half of your changes don't work. You either have to patch them or you have to roll them back. Um, but I have definitely worked in teams where you know, our Big Bang release was like that, and we had some car crash releases as part of the monolith. So I thought I would basically look into the data of this. And I was expecting to find that our change fail rate was much better, because the changes are small, they're easy to understand, they're independent, they're easy to reverse. You'd expect that things would tend to just get out and they'll be fine. Um, so. When we did the 12 releases a year, at least two would have some kind of problem, usually pretty bad. Most of, a lot of them would have patches, but at least a 16% failure rate, which actually isn't as bad as the worst case. Um, but of the 2,500 releases that we did for the content platform, it's less than a 1% failure rate. They're less than 25. And when those did go wrong, we'd normally just patch, you know, patch the code, release it. It would take very little time to do it. There wasn't, we'd very rarely roll back almost always just roll forward. That's so much easier than rolling back as well. So we are moving fast. We're failing much less than before. So it all sounds absolutely great. But, you know, operating microservices isn't easy. Uh, it's much harder than the monolith. And there are lots of reasons for that. Microservices are an efficient device for transforming business problems into distributed transaction problems. So effectively, things that used to be a call within the process, they're now over the network, and the network is unreliable. We have to deal with inconsistency along the way. We have to deal with partial failures. There is no way that we have a single transaction that we can live within. So we have to code to support all of that. But there are lots of things that help. I mean, people have been doing microservices now for a while. There are patterns. There are approaches. So I think that DevOps is pretty essential, uh, whatever you're doing because it's all about being aligned to providing value to your customers so that you're not having developers motivated to release code and operations motivated never to let developers release code. So you need to all be working together. But with microservices, the team that builds the system absolutely has to operate it. With the list problem that I talked about earlier, it took the developers who were working on that system more than 24 hours to work out what was going on. There is no chance that someone who wasn't working on that system would have been able to work out exactly what was happening. Um, the, the things that go wrong are complicated, complex. Uh, they're unpredictable. You know, we build resilience into it, so when things do go wrong, it's not something you could predict. The other thing is you can't stop and hand this stuff, stuff off to another team if you're releasing 10 times a day. It just doesn't scale. So they're never going to be up to date with what you're doing. So, you know, we, we basically do have a first line operations team, but they're mostly triage and they're mostly finding the right team. Uh, we expect the teams that are building the software to support it. And there's something related to this, which is high performing teams. This is another finding from Accelerate. I know I just sound like I'm selling you the book, but basically, high performing teams get to make their own decisions about tools and technology. And there are two reasons for this. The first thing is, actually, it makes developers happy. And that's not a bad thing to make developers happy, because they're going to be more de dedicated to working with you. It's great. But the, the second reason is, if they make the decisions, they're not waiting for someone else to make the decisions. So it's, again, it's all about reducing coordination. So you might want to provide some guidelines for people, but really, you just want people to be able to get on and do things. There is a flip side, and I work in the central team at the FT, but basically, as soon as you delegate choice to the teams, uh, central teams are going to really struggle to support stuff, because you'll just get so many different things in your system. I would hate to think about how many different databases we have somewhere at the FT. I probably don't know. It's quite hard to keep track of it. But there are approaches to deal with this as well. So you can make it someone else's problem. You know, this is really something that, that in modern architectures you should be looking to do. So you shouldn't be spending time installing and operating Kafka. 
get someone else to do it for you, buy the AWS version. Um, why would you install and run a database cluster and configure all the backups, get, get someone else to do that? Uh, lots of the FT runs on Heroku. It is more expensive to run on Heroku than it is AWS, but you don't spend as much time managing it. So maybe that's a better balance for your team. You can deliver more business functionality. Where we do run on AWS, we want to use the value adds. We don't want to just have an EC2 instance and install stuff on it. We want to use the queues. We want to use the databases that they offer. So basically, make operations into something that someone else does for you. And related to this, this is um, a diagram that Simon Wardley put together. He's an IT strategist, former CTO, talking about the evolution for software. And basically, new ideas that end up being successful. At Genesis, they are something that only experts do. And then everyone has to build their own custom version of something. Finally, it's obviously being used by loads of people. Someone will sell it as a product, <coughs> and then it becomes a commodity. And the example that often gets used is electricity. You know, we don't build our own power station now, but several centuries ago, you might have had to. More recently, the example is compute. You shouldn't be buying a server and racking it up in your data center. You should be getting it from a cloud provider. So you need to work out where you are along this curve. And if it's something that's available as a product or commodity, then really you don't want to, to be the person that's, that's building that. So buy rather than build, unless it's critical to your business. The things that are critical to your business, you absolutely need to be doing. So for us, our website, our paywall, our content management system, they're really differentiators. We want to get that right. But do, you, do we want to spend our time building a cluster orchestration, orchestrator, which my team did, but as soon as Kubernetes was available, we'd moved up the curve, we moved to that. You need to build observability into your system because how you debug things changes a lot when you move from the monolith to microservice. So I can remember being told about bugs in the monolith, basically getting the, that version of the code locally, spinning up my, my system, um, and stepping through debugging. That was, how, that was how I found and tried to reproduce a problem. And logging as a result wasn't very good because you didn't really use logs very much. You just tried to reproduce locally, but you can't do that now. Um, it's too complicated. The system that you could have on your developer laptop is never gonna be the same as production. In some cases you can't because you're using um, tools that are only available in the cloud. So basically you need to change the way that you develop to allow you to know what's going on when things go wrong, and that's about observability. Can you infer what's going on in the system by looking at its external outputs? Those are generally metrics, logs, monitoring. I mean, there are other things as well, but that's the basics. Logs are great for telling you about events, uh, but they're spread all over the place when you're operating microservices, so you need to aggregate them into a central location. So there will be lots of logs, aggregate them into one place. We use Splunk. Um, generally, when I say this, people say, are you made of money? But it works for us. So uh, there'll be lots of logs though. Uh, you may need to get rid of some of them because in a monolith, you might have logged the access into the monolith in the microservice. If you log the access into each layer, suddenly you have a lot. But you need to be able to tie together all the logs that relate to a particular event. You need that ability to tag it with a unique identifier. Because we did this before, things like Zipkin and Open Tracing were really widely used, we built our own system. So what we have is a library that says, look for this particular header and look at the unique identifier on it. And if there is one, you, it's your responsibility to log it in every log line, it's your responsibility to pass it on to every other service that you call, to put it in the message that you send. And if it's not there, you generate one. And this is always used at the FT. There's not a service that, that gets built that doesn't have this ability because it's so useful when things go wrong to be able to track a real event. Metrics are about capturing measurements over time. So maybe the current request rate for a particular API. It is tempting when you start building microservices to catch, uh, capture a lot of metrics. We certainly did that, um, but we realized that you end up having lots that are overlapping. So really you've got a call coming in from a client going through a stack of microservices. You really care probably about what the nearest API to that client is doing. So if the database is slow, everything in between is gonna be slow. And I'd say keep it simple. So there's a red metric, so that's request rate, error rate, duration. That's, that's pretty handy generally and will give you a lot of what you need if you need to know something about it. Distributed systems are flaky. Uh, lots of things can go wrong. You need to build in resilience. 
uh, when transient things happen, your ideal is that your system just kind of recovers without you having to do anything. And that basically is about accepting that you will generally be in a state of grey failure. There's almost always something that's not quite working in a distributed system. But if it's broken, but it doesn't break the, the actual f uh, functionality that you want to deliver, then I don't think it matters. You don't want to know about it. Uh, when we started doing microservices, I got something like 20,000 emails overnight about services being unable to connect to Puppet Master for a planned maintenance. Like, I don't care, <laughs> and it didn't really help me get through my emails uh, either. Charity is the co-founder of Honeycomb. She says it well. You want to embrace failure and lean into resiliency. I see people taking photos, so I will pause. Um, Charity is well worth um, following on Twitter, and she does some really good blogs as well. So you're going to retry on failure, because there are often transient issues. And frankly, if you can retry, just do it. But you need to be smart in how you do it, because the worst thing that can happen is there's a service that's been down, it's just getting back to its feet, and it gets hit with all the requests that have been waiting in between. So you really want to do exponential back off and retry. So you try, you wait a second, you retry, you wait two seconds. But even then, you can end up with a lot of traffic when something is just recovering. So another thing you can do is give up if it's taking too long. So we don't do this, but I think it's a really good pattern. Uh, the request comes in and something is stamped in the header to say, give up after five seconds. And every service that, that is processing this checks that timestamp. And if the time has, has gone past, just abandons the processing. As long as you build with that in mind, you just stop getting lots of traffic that's never going to actually be useful, because there's going to be some time out at the top of the stack anyway, so you're just doing processes for no reason, processing for no reason. We want to build, for our critical systems, we want to build in multiple regions, for example, and we want to be able to fail over. And we want that failover to be uh, automatic, but it's surprising how often there are intermittent issues and we actually need a human to do a hard failover. Um, one thing I found as a developer turned ops person is developers really want to understand what's going on. And actually, quite often, they can start trying to understand when really they should mitigate first. It doesn't matter what the reason is that your US stack is unhealthy. Fail over to the EU and then indulge your curiosity afterwards. Um, it's really hard to get people to do that, but it's essential. Uh, we're fine with having systems failed over to a single region overnight, because we'd rather have a group of people who are well rested looking at it the next day. And generally speaking, it's OK. Yeah, you know, you'd have to have a second failure, you're probably not going to. The problem with um, building resilience in and grey failure is you have to understand when something's really wrong. Because if things, if alerts are firing all the time for like transient issues, it's really hard to know that. And this is actually not all of our operations dashboard. I couldn't fit it all on the screen. Um, you can't look at that and tell what's up. I mean, I can say it's not very red, that's probably okay. <laughs> that's not bad, that's really not something I want to be. Um, I really, really want to get to the point where we can concentrate on our business capabilities, the things that we do as a company. So things like, can a subscriber read news on the FT? Can we publish articles? These are the business capabilities, and so my dream dashboard has very, very few tiles on it, and they all say something about the business thing, and that if I could look at that and know that if it's green, we're fine, I don't need to uh, phone anyone up overnight, I would be really, really pleased. That is what we're aiming to have by the end of next year. So how will we get this? Well, one thing we found that works is synthetic monitoring. So it's monitoring because it's happening all the time in production. We found that it's much better to be doing, uh, sort of effectively testing in production than it is in a staging environment, because what, what do you care about? Do you care about your staging environment or do you care about production? So we do monitoring, we do it all the time. It's synthetic because it's a fake request. So what we've done is we've taken a, an old article that we know editorial are never going to republish, and we just publish it every minute. So we wrote a little microservice called the Synthetic Monitoring Service. Um, everything in the box at the bottom, effectively it's a black box, so it can change and it doesn't affect your monitoring, as long as the input and the output don't change. So unlike acceptance tests where I spent far too much time trying to fix up fixtures, this, is, this doesn't need to be changed very often at all. So it basically um, publishes the article 
checks to see that it's available from the read API. There's a timestamp so you can tell it's the new version. And we just monitor it like we monitor any other system. So we literally just say, is the synthetic monitoring service healthy? If so, we know that we're able to publish. The first month or two after we made this live, people kept start restarting the synthetic monitoring service when the monitoring wasn't when the publishing wasn't working. That took a bit of a mind shift, but we got there. But the other thing about this is it helps us know about things that are broken, even when no user's currently doing the thing. So news publishing has peaks and troughs. We do a ton of publishing on a Friday night for the weekend. Um, there are days where we do no publishing. You know, we don't tend to publish uh, much at the weekend. Um, we have bank holidays. Um, if you don't have something that's a regular heartbeat, the danger is that you set up an alert that says, oh my God, we haven't published anything in three hours. That is guaranteed to fire on Christmas Day. But with synthetic publishing, it's happening. It's happening every minute. So it's OK. It, it makes it much easier to set up monitoring if you've got that regular heartbeat of a thing. One thing I didn't realize when I started doing microservices was quite how much of your time you'll spend migrating stuff. So they're a fact of life, right? Upgrades, migrations. It could be that you built something. Uh, and it's really complicated now that you can buy it, so you're actually going to make that change, or maybe you need to upgrade the version of the database. Maybe there's a security vulnerability. Uh, we had to upgrade the version of Node in all of our microservices because of a security vulnerability. That was a lot of change to have to do. Um, you're going to have to do it, so it's a good idea to plan for it. Doing anything 150 times is painful. It quickly racks up. Even if it's only 10 minutes per service, you're suddenly talking weeks to do a thing. So um, you need things to be automated. Wherever possible, you need automation around this. So your deployment pipeline should be templated. So if the security team say, we're changing our security provider, we now need you to scan all of your repos with Sneak. Uh, you want to make that change in one place and have 150 build pipelines updated. You don't want to go in through and do it manually. It's far too painful. And that, we've done that. We've done that kind of thing. So if you're operating microservices um, in containers, uh, it's a good idea to use a service mesh. Again, we don't because we were building this system before service meshes really existed. But Basically, service meshes will do discovery, load balancing, failure recovery, log shipping, metrics, monitoring, tracing, all of these things that are great. So your services just become very much about uh, the business functionality, and the service mesh handles everything else. So I think it's really worth looking into that. The way we've done it, which tends to be libraries that all of the uh, services share, if we ever need to change those libraries, that's a lot of change. Every code base has things that change often and things that don't change often. There's a really interesting uh, book called your, uh, Code as a Crime Scene that visualizes some of that. It's really interesting to look at your code base, and there's, there's tooling around it as well. Look at your code base and see here's where the hotspots are. Um, one of the nice things about microservices is that you don't have to keep everything uh, in step, and in fact, you shouldn't. So we started writing microservices in Java. At some point, we decided Go was better for us. We didn't go back and rewrite everything else. We just, all the new ones were in Go. But sometimes you do need to upgrade things, uh, and maybe you haven't touched it for years. Uh, you might find that that build pipeline doesn't work anymore. It's entirely possible. Uh, you don't really want to find that out when you're under stress, when you're having to do something because it's, it's basically security vulnerability. And we do have some teams at the FT that just build all of their services every night. They don't deploy them, but they build them. So they would catch if it wasn't going to be releasable. And I think that's a... That's a good thing to do because it's a little pain consistently rather than a lot of pain possibly at some point. But what happens when the large team that was building your system it moves on to new things? You have a smaller team. When the people who knew every aspect of this, including why you pick these technologies, have gone on to something else. Um, I think the critical thing is that systems need to be owned. And they need to be owned by a team, not a person. So we sometimes have a feature team that will build a system, and I'll say, oh, who's going to own it long term? And they go, no, it's fine. Laura will keep an eye on it, and it'll be absolutely great. And I'm like, well, when Laura leaves the FT, that's going to be a problem. What if Laura's current team don't want to spare her time for doing something on this? So I think everything has to be owned by a team. It's hard, because there are always some systems where no one really feels like they own it, but that's something that I think we've accepted 
uh, mostly at the FT, still a few educators. If you're finding it impossible to get someone to own something, I think you need to think about whether it's valuable. Like, if, if I can't find an owner for something, it's like, okay, we should shut it down. Business hate shutting things down, um, but then the business and product owners tend to think that everything just runs forever with no investment and could be fixed immediately by anyone. And that's not true. You've, got, you've always got a cost of keeping a system running. It's not just the hardware cost. It's the cost of having enough people who understand how to do stuff with it. Um, so we aren't winning on this one, but we're trying. So hands up if you like writing documentation. Good. I'm really glad because <laughs> I think it's valuable, but it's always the last thing. right? It's always the thing that people are like, well, I will write documentation, but later. Operational documentation is very important. We have over a thousand services at the FT, so it's really hard to get everyone to keep all of those things up to date. And some of them have quite a lot of overlap because they're part of a bigger system. You don't really want to just repeat the same information about it. And we've been grappling with this for a long time. We started off with a searchable runbook library. Uh, so the idea was, here is a bunch of runbooks, the same operational information for each of them, but it was stored in a very flat format. And what that meant is when I left my last job and joined my new job, there were 150 lines in this database that needed to be changed to say, Sarah's not the tech lead anymore. Um, that's not very good. It's, it's basically, it's not a flat, it's not a flat structure, things like operational documentation. We did get one thing right, which is every runbook had a unique system code and we use that in other places too. So we tag AWS resources with the system code, we add it to logging, we add it to alerting and monitoring. It ties everything together. But what we realized is that we needed to represent this stuff as a graph. The relationship of the system is to a team that has a tech lead. So. You know, we have teams, systems, people. The nice thing also about having it as a graph is we add new things all the time. As we understand the systems that we have, we can add something else into it. So we recently added AWS accounts so we can link the teams to their AWS accounts. And we can ask interesting questions by navigating a, a graph. So we can say, uh, let's look at all of the systems that are associated to Sarah's team's AWS code and work out the cost of the resources. What it means also is when I move role, there's one relationship to update. Just this team has a different tech lead. And we've got a system that we call BizOps. Um, it's business operations. But it's basically everything about our systems um, built on top of the graph. And we have lots of information we want to store. One of my colleagues started keeping a Google Sheet of all of the Google Sheets that people had that had system information in. So there's something like 30 sheets that people had, some list of systems where they were storing information. But they all live in someone's account. You can't find them all, and you just don't know. So we want everything, everything should be in here. So you know, probably one of the commonest things that I say is, is it in BizOps? Can you add it to BizOps? Um, but it's great because you can do things like our, our security team, we've, uh, we've brought in all of our GitHub repositories and link them to teams. So our security team can easily go from there is a scanning that's found a vulnerability to the team that can fix it. And we can run reports to find systems that are unowned or unsupported, deprecated. Maybe, they've, maybe we have a system that we've said it's um, discontinued, but it's not yet actually been decommissioned. We're still paying the costs of all the resources associated with it. And we've started doing some stuff with visualization. Just to have a bit of fun with it and say, yeah, you know, you can see where I, what my relationship is to a bunch of systems. So how do we get the people to fill in the information? Because it's still the problem of there's a lot of information to fill in. What we found is it helps if you can give people something in return. This is kind of nudge theory. Um, if you make it easy and attractive for people to do something, if you make it something social, then they're more likely to do it. So earlier this year, we replaced our monitoring dashboards. So we have a bunch of different monitoring software at the FT. We now aggregate it all together into Prometheus, and we built some tooling around that that we call Heimdall. And Heimdall gives you a view of your systems. So we automatically generate team dashboards based on the data that's in that BizOps repository. So if the dashboard's wrong, it's because your data's wrong. So it really did persuade people to fix, fix that up. And previously, people had to handwrite their own dashboards in uh, Python. So they're much happier, basically, to just get a dashboard for free. And we surfaced some information. There's a bit there, I think. Oop. Decommissioned. 
And people said, that's not decommissioned. Well, I was like, well, your data says it's decommissioned, so you want to fix that. So this was the start. The next thing we did was we thought, well, actually, really like um, the idea of developers reading the operational documentation. Because what I found is people trying to solve the problem are looking at the operational documentation, but the developers are looking at the README because they just go straight to the code base. That's where you naturally go. You don't look at the runbook that operations have. So we thought, well, what if we kept them all together? So we wanted to keep runbooks in the repository. So we have a markdown file format uh, that you can store all your content and have it with your repository. This is just a tool that lets you check that it's, it's valid, just so that you don't get that wrong. And then if you call our change API when you uh, release your code, we'll automatically suck the updates into the central uh, system. So this also helped us migrate everyone to our new change API because it gave people stuff that they liked. And now we've got a thing called the system operability score. So we looked at our runbooks and said, what are the critical fields? What are the fields that are important? And we just created a scoring system for it. And we can score each system, we can aggregate it to teams, and we can aggregate it to groups. So you can see how people are doing um, by comparison to other groups. And what you get is some teams are incredibly competitive. So this is um, a guy from Enterprise Services pointing out to me that his team had overtaken my team. <laughs> this happens a lot. My team's uh, OKRs, we do OKRs, and we started doing this year. A lot of them are about, we're going to be top. No, we are absolutely going to be top. But what this has done is, with some systems, like so um, our print sites, so documentation about the various places where the FT is printed, had no operational documentation. Now we have operational documentation for all of them, and that they're they're at 98% complete. Um, we did eventually discover that our audit logs were quite useful because we did have one developer go and um, deliberately make someone else's operational documentation worse. <laughs> Which is just funny, um, but it's great. It just shows we're engaging in this stuff. And we can, what I didn't realize when we set this up is actually it's brilliant to uh, encourage people to do OKRs because we've measured it for you. So you can say we're going to improve our operational documentation by 10%, uh, you can do it. Um, we know that automated is not enough because you can write anything into a field and, and automated stuff will say, oh yeah, we've discovered that you have filled it in. Although we do look for don't panic and we look for to do and we don't count those. But we basically do a manual review. After it's got to a certain level on the score, we will manually review it um, to make sure that the content's actually good. Um, and that works, that works really well. We recently, as in while I've been away at this conference, um, added a thing where once you've had a manual review, if you haven't fixed it up, you lose points every week until you fix it up. This was a bit of a surprise to everybody, um, but it's kind of uh, encouraging people to go and fix up problems. So the latest thing we're doing is a thing called single system view. Um, this is the Christmas version. We had a Halloween version as well. So it's basically a heat map. Um, black, the black ones are things where we don't have a score, but you know, red, 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 green. And it's any information we've got that indicates what's good about a system or bad. So at the moment, we, we can pull in errors, we can look at GitHub information. So for example, if you have a system that's linked to a repo that's been archived, that's probably a bit worrying. Um, and we could just add more and more to this stuff. Uh, and I like the fact we've got this, the Christmas um, stuff. I was in Jennifer's talk this morning. I think being playful, you know, we, we're building stuff for the FT's developers, and we're a little bit playful as a group, so it makes sense to, to have fun. This has just started, but we'll probably do aggregation visualization as well for this. Um, the final thing I want to talk about is practice. So you need as an organization to practice things because you don't want to discover that the instructions are incorrect uh, or you don't have the right permissions when you're woken up at two in the morning. So you practice stuff. It's back to that whole thing of if it hurts, do it more frequently. We practice failing over the FT.com website uh, every week. So it's a perfectly normal thing for people to do. We had our chief operating officer wanted to come and intern with, uh, in technology to find out more about technology. We had him sit down and fail over the website. He said he felt like he was about to do heart surgery. But we were able to do that because we're so practiced that we know that he can do it and it will be fine, which is great. So failovers, database restores. Um, you know what they say about a backup? If you've never restored it, it's just a file. I mean, it actually might not even be a file. You might just think there's a file there. Chaos engineering. So chaos, chaos is cool, uh, but the business hates the term. So I know that people are moving away from chaos to talk about resilience engineering because it's not about chaos. 
It's actually about understanding what things look like. People don't necessarily understand what normal looks like because they've never stopped to look at it. I've heard of an experiment where someone actually didn't change anything, but the team spent ages looking at everything, thinking, oh, what's gone wrong? What's gone wrong? So you basically say, well, what can you change? What could you change? Pick something to change that you think is going to be fine. It is, you know, you really don't want to be the person that breaks production just for an experiment. Um, so look at what you can change, minimize the blast radius, work out what you expect to see happen, run the test, and see if you were right. Now you can buy tools to do chaos engineering, but you can get a lot of, uh, you can get a long way with just very basic stuff. Um, this is supposed to be owned two regions. What happens if I turn one off? If I disconnect this network connection? Generally, we don't find that we see what we expect. Our monitoring doesn't fire when we expect it to, or vice versa. So, wrapping up, building and operating microservices is hard work. I think we probably all know that. It means your culture has to change to be successful. And you have to maintain knowledge of the services that are live. You need to work at this. Um, otherwise, you probably want to have the conversation about continued investment. Do we want to continue to invest in it? You need to plan for what's going to happen as they start to become legacy, because that is going to, it's coming for all of us. But the major thing is really, it's about the business value of moving fast. If you're doing microservices and you're not releasing regularly, why, why are you doing them? Because you are paying a huge cost for it. Optimize for releasing code frequently. Thank you. No time. Thank you so